So how's the uh, Cloud Foundry Summit treating everyone? Yeah. yeah? So far, so good? People are trickling in, so I'll, I'll go slow. So this is uh, a talk about a lot of things. And I usually give a disclaimer that we're going to go really fast. I have 30 minutes, supposedly, but I'll probably go long. And I'm going to go through about 90 some odd slides. And some of them are... <laughs> Some of them have more bullet points than others, but uh, the main thing I want to do is take you on a little journey, tell a little narrative, and uh, for some of you, it'll relate to things that you've experienced in your career, um, maybe on a uh, similar arc or, or observed from uh, different personas. Uh, my career so far, I've kind of spanned many different roles um, inside of IT as a developer, a sysadmin, uh, a founder of a company, and just thinking uh, really about how all these things fit together. So the alternative title, if I can get this thing to change, there we go, is uh, Systems Thinking, is the new black. Just by any uh, so show of hands, did anyone come to last year's summit at the, at the Hilton? OK. How many people saw my talk? How many people saw it on video? So this is all, this is all online, but the ideas in that talk, I think, are are key to actualizing some of the things that you're going to see in this talk and also some of the things you're probably trying to do inside of your organizations. It definitely has, so it has a bunch of information about organizational learning. And uh, I used the stonecutter metaphor. So this is another alternative title. And this is a stonecutter's quest for nice things. Do you guys recall the, uh, the morning session with Sam where he's talking about the, I, I have a slightly different version, but it's basically this idea of connecting to a higher purpose uh, or, or not, right? Like, there's different levels of understanding of your craft. And the lowest level is the stone cutter that he gets paid to cut stones, right? He knows that he, he can make, uh, you know, food for his family because he cuts stones. He has a skill. And then the second level is the stone cutter that is, he's just fascinated with the actual craft, Right? Like if you ask him questions, he'll get excited about how, how the stones are laid and the tools and you know, how the servers are configured with this one configuration management tool. And then the last one is the one who's connected to this higher purpose of, of the cathedral. So this is our lowly stone cutter. And you know, my career, and I'll just go through this really fast, but I've been involved in a lot of startups. And we're going to actually talk through some of that. Um, most people know me from Puppet. I did a lot of work early days especially on OpenStack. And then uh, my, my background, we're going to go through a lot, but I did some writing for O'Reilly. This is a little book I helped write on web operations. And there's a lot of great stuff. And I'm packing my house to move to Los Angeles uh, from Pittsburgh. And I came across this book just, just uh, this weekend. And I read, I read this book. And it's from 2010, but it's really stood up. You know, and, and we're five years out from that. And anyone who's interested in, in really building like a new future, and we're going to really see a lot of, of the ideas that are embodied in that book. But it's a great reference if you're interested in DevOps and operations and really managing this stuff at scale. And then I've been involved in, in the DevOps movement. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I've been on the core organizing team for DevOps since the beginning of DevOps days. And we organize uh, you know dozens of those around the world now. And if you're not had the opportunity to participate in the DevOps days, then I think it will really be eye-opening to see the communities of practice that come together and openly share the information. And, and this, this whole thing is very similar. Like, we're, we're trying to build a community of practice around uh, Cloud Foundry. But uh, traditionally, a lot, of the, a lot of the organizations that are quote-unquote enterprise, they, they, tend to, they tend to hide information. They often hide information from themselves internally, but they, they try to hide information from each other, where one of the things that you saw in, in the DevOps communities is even though people are working on, you know, on face on some somewhat competitive um, services, that they would often share the, the way that they were solving these common undifferentiating problems with their infrastructure. And then, dun, 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 I work for Pivotal. Uh, I don't know. If anyone needs a job, we're hiring. <laughs> yeah! And then I try to amuse myself on Twitter, and it might amuse you too, but I'm a little idea, and that's probably the fastest way to get my attention, even if you work with me and have my email. 
which I'm usually about a thousand emails behind on. All right, so if you saw my talk last year, this is funny. Three stone cutters walk into a Pareto inefficient Nash equilibrium. Go watch that talk and you can laugh later. I'm not going to talk about Cloud Foundry. What I'm actually going to talk about is all the stuff that kind of is around Cloud Foundry. And by, by relief, by the, the way that that silhouette, then we'll kind of have Cloud Foundry left over, if that makes sense. So I like to do this. So let's start with the conclusion. So there's a bunch of buzzword bingo crap that like Gartner publishes and everyone does, and some of the words mean something, and some of the times they mean different things to different people. Uh, and you get into all sorts of strange conversations if you don't start each conversation with the definitions. Like for this conversation, this is what we're going to mean. This is what, and that's, that's fair, that's fine. But I'm going to argue this is really just one thing that DevOps, continuous delivery, microservices, like these are all really part of the same phenomena that's happened. Uh, and these things are enabling, these things are dynamic, these things are not really finished. And what we're able to do today will really evolve rapidly, especially as, as these communities cooperate and, and drive that innovation forward. And we can come back and we'll, we'll have a little bit more definition around each of these words by the end. But first, I'm going to tell you a story about me. All right, so in the beginning, well, not the real beginning, but I got a job as a developer. I had a job. I, was, I had a degree in math, and I had a minor in CS, and I had a, a professor. He was a theoretical chemist, and he wanted to have this project. And he's like, well, you, can you do this? And I was like, I have no idea how to do that. Yes! So he gave me... <laughs> He gave me like tiny bits of money, and, and I was really smart, and I had Google, but I really had no idea what I was doing. Right, so I was sort of left to my own devices. There was this half cobbled together idea that this grad student had sort of implemented for this guy. His, his, his vision was he wanted to build a way for these theoretical chemists who were redoing a lot of the same calculations over and over to share the, these pre-calculated uh, chemical, kinetic, and thermodynamic um, from first principles. And so he, this idea was, his original idea was he wanted to have this database. So you'd have this database, but you were going to ship these like kind of synchronized databases across the community. But that's a terrible idea when you could build an uh, online system. And this was right around, it's like 2001, so you're starting to see like internet stuff come online. And I was like, well, how about we build it? as a web service. And I convinced them that we should do that. And I learned how to do a bunch of stuff uh, with my, my little red JSP book and my Google. Like, I was able to build a bunch of stuff. So I did this with no experience, uh, really no one teaching me how to do it. Uh, I didn't know anything about testing. I didn't know anything about backups. I didn't really know anything about servers. So I was like learning how to configure you know, Apache to do the, the whatever thing to set up the the Tomcat thing to set up this other thing, and then I'd go write the little bit of code, and I'd just kind of make this thing work. And it was just me and my server that, like, served the website off of my desk, literally. And, and it was just, like, I made it work. It mostly worked. And <laughs> it worked enough that the guy got a $5 million grant to, like, make it, real, like, more real. And at the time, he was paying me, like, nothing, right? So... And, and everyone was making a ridiculous amount of money doing like the same exact kind of uh, technology. So I had a conversation where I was like, I think you should pay me more than nothing. <laughs> and, and he was like, well, you know, and, and I think in, um, in academics, like people are really used to slave labor for some reason. <laughs> so, so he's like, well, you know, maybe. And then there's all this stuff going on and there's all these jobs. And I was like, well, I think what I should go do is go work for someone else because they'll pay me more money. You know, I'm looking at the, the job postings. And in between that conversation and the date that I set to leave, uh, then you have September 11th. And then, and then no one would talk to you after that. Like, it, it just basically like, evaporated. So there's no, there's no work. And every job that was posted had you know, hundreds of resumes. And you just, you know, I, it, was, it was ridiculous, though, because you, you get in these conversations with the hiring manager. 
And I was trying to, I, was, I always try to be proactive, or, you know, and I'm getting better or worse at that, depending on how you look at it as my career goes along. But I, I wrote out to this guy, I was like, hey, you know, I'm trying to, trying to make my way, like, can you give me some advice on how to do this better? What about my resume? He's like, well, we had all these things, you know, hundreds of them, and we we're only going to interview a dozen people. And, and so we decided to interview people that only had, uh, you know, people, anyone who didn't have uh, 10 years' experience in Java, we didn't, we didn't interview them. It's like, hmm, it's 2001. <laughs> Java came out in 1995. <laughs> Good luck. So then I went to Hyde. I went to Hyde from the economy. So this is around 2002. And I went to grad school, and I did a program at University of Utah called uh, Computational Science. So it was basically envisioned as this bridge between the computer scientists who didn't know how to do math and the math people who didn't know how to do uh, computers. And what I specialize, or what I focus a lot on, is building these bioelectric fields, models of bioelectric fields. And so we build the, these torso models with like the tissue and the anisotropic um, you know, resistance and conductance across the tissue, and then we would do these visualizations. So I TA'd this class to do visualization of the bioelectric fields in, in the, lots of stuff. Anyways, it was pretty fun. Um, did anyone go to grad school? Did anyone, does anyone wish you were perpetually in grad school? <laughs> um, if you could make money doing that, back to that slave labor thing. Uh, but what I learned there, which was formative, is this idea of technical debt because this thing called Ski Run, which is, you can go see it, it's uh, how you would you'd be able to make these uh, types of visualizations. It was a project that had a five-year grant for like millions of dollars, but the way that it was architected was, and this is where Conway's Law comes in, which is, does anyone know Conway's Law? I use it in like every talk, so I start to assume people know what it is. So Conway's Law is this idea that organizations will build uh, systems that mirror the communication structures of the organization, right? So if you communicate in a certain way, like often this is, this is true in almost every product I see. If you see API level problems, then if this group doesn't talk to this group very well, then you're going to have that problem, like, all the time. So in, in this project, uh, although I did learn to use uh, source control, you had a, a project that was this long-standing uh, grant where the majority of the code was written by a grad student who was only there maybe working on it for a year, right? And, and so, like, over a five-year period, you can imagine that all their incentives and all that communication was perfectly aligned with building great software, <laughs> right? It's, it's what I like to euphemistically refer to as academic C. And maybe some of you have seen or written some of this code before. But there was really, really no, what I would consider, very mature process. And in, in most cases, there's very little regard for the future. It's like you have some little bit, and the parts that I worked on were mostly about um, doing algebra. So the, people had implemented a bunch of naive uh, ways to do matrix multiplication, and so I basically replaced it all with the, the Fortran Leapack libraries and did a bunch of stuff with that. So I was mostly focused on the math part, but it was super fun. And then I graduated, uh, my wife started medical school, and we had our first son in about a two-month span. So that was the end of the rock and roll lifestyle, <laughs> clearly. And, and she decided that I should get a job <laughs> and, and try to feed us. And I sent, I sent out some uh, resumes and put one on Dice.com, and, and then a recruiter called me. And he's like, will you go to this interview? And I was like, uh, sure. He's like, on your resume it says VTK, which stands for Visualization Toolkit. And they need someone, or they're looking for someone who knows GTK. So that's, that, that's pretty close. So, so go talk to him. This is a true story. So, so I go to this, this group, and I, I spent, I was there probably 40 minutes. And I talked to two people, and one guy was in charge of marketing. And what they were advertising for, what they were looking for at the time, was someone to come and work on user interfaces for this device I'm going to show you in a second. And they had a bunch of ideas about how that should work, and they, they had someone who didn't know how to code that was trying to work on them. And they were just kind of desperate at that point. And I, I'd been working on user interfaces and usability with respect to visualization. And I started, 
I have a, I don't know, character flaw, but I get really fixated on little things and I want to go like find out all this stuff. And so I got onto this uh, stuff about usability and Jacob Nielsen and all these people that like write about usability and UX, you know, going back a uh, decade. And so I was, you know, way into like all these ideas about how to do this. And so they got excited about that. And then I went across the hall and I talked to the VP of engineering. And the VP of engineering is like, looking at my stuff, and then he's, he's like, so you've been doing math models of bioelectric fields in the, the torso of a human, and then uh, aren't you going to be bored working on user interfaces for like our crappy little device? And I said, uh, I am pretty good at entertaining myself. And he said, come back on Monday. So, so I, I joined this adventure where we, we spent $26 million and had really nothing to show for it at the end. <laughs> Except for this Wikipedia article, which you can go read if you look up uh, Black Dog and Realm Systems. Uh, so we had this little thing. We made the boards. We made the. We had like a custom kernel that ran on this thing, all the way up through this operating system. This is uh, some of the specs for the device, and we had this big vision about solving identity, and we were actually doing some things that are very. Uh, much the same problems that everyone's trying to solve with the kind of IoT. It was like you had to provision this thing, and what we did was build a on-the-fly Debian packaging of the of the policy. So your administrator could configure all these things that you're supposed to have access to in the back end, and then it would make an on-demand uh, Debian package of that. And then when your key got online, it would download just the things for you. And it was like it was fun, and it was one of the best. Uh, it was one of the best engineering teams I ever worked on. And it was really formative for me. So I worked with this guy who wrote the book on Make. Like, he literally wrote this book on, on GNU Make. And he taught me a bunch of things about how to think about problems. And it wasn't so much like, do this, do this, do this. It's like, you should not implement something until you thought about three ways to do it. Right? You should, you know, like, you should test these things. And he had, I, I had a, uh, <laughs> one time I was, uh, because we were cross-compiling these things for this little chip on our Linux machine. So you, and, it, and it's funny now because everyone's all excited about ch uh, containers, but we were, have these like Cheroot environments to go build this stuff and like put it onto these devices. And, he, and he's like, you're not testing your code for this interface, for this other thing. And I was like, it's impossible. He's like, no, it's not. And I was like, it's impossible. I tried. He's like, OK, OK, I'm going to come, and we're going to pair, and we're going to make it work. I was like, OK. So, so he came over to my desk, and after like literally two hours one day of like trying to get all this testing, like, and we're, it was Boost and C++ to like do this thing and, and test it, and he had like these high aspirations, and finally he's like, he just tapped out. He's like, fine, you don't have to test that. I was like, I wanted to, I really wanted to, couldn't do it. <laughs> but the thing that w was interesting here is it was a uh, like perfect display of Conway's law again, and. and there were all these little kind of Game of Thrones ideas about the different teams and everyone on this thing. And I kind of broke it accidentally because I was working on this like C code and like platform code on this one side. And then there's this Java side where they did the actual server stuff to do the configuration. And I'd implemented a bunch of stuff that needed to have the server put together those configs and then push them to the devices. And I went and talked to this guy you know, for weeks or whatever, and he's like, you know, oh, that's awesome, that's awesome. I was like, well, when do you think we're going to see this system work end to end? And he's like, well, it's not in my sprint. It's not in my stories. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Why do you think I spent all this time explaining how this worked? Like, don't you get this? Like, we sit and we hear the vision for what this product's supposed to do. Like, aren't, why aren't you connected to this cathedral we're trying to build? And then, uh, so my solution was basically to just go implement it on the, on the Java server. Uh, which made everyone mad. Uh, well, not everyone. It made some people very happy because now this thing worked. Uh, but it made the people who thought that that was their code very unhappy. And then as a result, uh, the, the vice president of engineering decided it was, it was better for everyone to get work done and not have uh, this ownership. So he dissolved all the teams, and everyone just became one pool. And then, then it was like a free-for-all for me. I was like, I'm going to learn how the kernel works. And like, I could go do that stuff. And then the next week, I would just grab a story from you know, whatever part of the system I wanted to. So that was... Uh, a, a really rapid iteration of my leveling up on how computers work. And, and there's you know, stuff that I wouldn't have been able to do inside of a, another um, organization. But one of the things this did for me is like, I disassociated my identity from any aspect of anything. Right? Like, I don't care 
if you're a sysadmin or you're a developer or you're a Java guy or a C++ guy, like, it's just, it's just something you just do. Like, you want to make it work, you make it work. Right? And, like, if you attach your identity to things, I think that's limiting and it's, and it's bad. And that kind of comes back to play in the, in the um, DevOps story. So then the next thing that happens is that company runs out of money and they go from basically 100 people down to 15 people in six months. And I was in the layoffs between my friends who were uh, getting two-week severance and my friends who missed paychecks. So, like, my group was just, hey, don't come back. And then, but I didn't ever miss paychecks. And well, here's another aside, because we, we uh, developed all this expertise on Flash. And the team that we worked on there is, they eventually built uh, Fusion IO. I don't know, does anyone know who Fusion IO is? So, they, so I would have been, depending on when I signed, I would have been like the fifth to the ninth employee of Fusion IO. And the, but the, the deal was they were like, hey, we know you just unraveled and like you didn't get paychecks and like your friends didn't get paychecks and then uh, we might be able to pay you in nine months when we raise money. Or these guys across town had just raised their $5 million A round and they're like, we'll pay you a six figure salary. So that was a really easy decision for my wife to, <laughs> for my wife to make. Uh, I'm losing my mic, I think. Or no, that's just the card. If everyone can still hear me. Okay, so then this was kind of the opposite. So the, the first team I worked on was a dream team from an engineering perspective, and we had this deep expertise across a wide bunch of things, but we had this pathological understanding of our business. And in this other startup, we had actually a very clear business mission, and we had pathological technology. So we had a, a CTO who had a, a CS degree, and had never worked for anyone, had never had any mentoring, who could type 120 words a minute, and he could fix any problem in the universe with another if, or six. <laughs> and so that was, that was the code base. Was like this, his specialty was the if-else Plinko. It, it, was the, it, it, was, it was in three places across JSPs and code, the if-else Plinko had to magically uh, construct the, the string that got put straight into the JDBC to call the database and then come back out and then you had to have the same if-else Plinko to, to recover the result and then, yeah, it was terrible. I, I had a contest once at a, at a conference about who, who saw the worst code ever and, you know, after about an hour into this, this meal, everyone was just tapping out. They're like, no, you win. And I wasn't even to the good parts yet. <laughs> like, it was, it was amazing. So the, what I learned there is kind of the opposite lessons, but I was, I was really empowered. It was like one of the first places where I wasn't just a developer, like all of a sudden I, I could do, do things that other people couldn't do. I was able to, I was put in charge of a bunch of stuff because I proved I could solve these problems really rapidly. And then the, the CEO kind of, he couldn't, he couldn't um, undermine his CTO, but he kind of knew they were in trouble. And so he put me in this position to, to act as like a check and balance. And, and then uh, I learned a bunch of stuff about team dynamics and, and more Conway's law. But what we'd built looked suspiciously like, like this Rube Goldberg machine. And we had a lot of automation. I mean, we're deploying, at that time, this was like 2006-ish. Our, our infrastructure was roughly like 50 servers. Um, each of those were like uh, eight cores. Like they're, they're pretty beefy servers for the day. And uh, we were doing th about $30 million in revenue. Or not revenue, but um, transactions through it. And we were taking, like, a small piece of that. Um, so this was kind of how we did stuff. Like, we had, uh, I didn't know anything other than what I'd learned. And most of what I'd learned wasn't really about doing these large-scale deployments on servers up to that. And those aren't really large-scale in uh, retrospect. But we, we shared a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, there's the, the doitnow.sh do it now dot s a or do it now five you know like you just keep like changing these things and you, and you share them and this is kind of what things look like <laughs> and and so that that story that narrative is really you know every day you go to work and if you did a deployment the night before then you're often uh, greeted by a bunch of emails from your East Coast clients who hadn't been able to do transactions on their e-commerce store because you broke the way checkout works or something. And this was a pretty common... Uh, has anyone ever lived this movie? Anyone ever seen this? 
So as uh, it turns out, my roommate from uh, Reed College was Luke, and Luke had already sort of thought a little bit about this. And I had been part of the puppet community, and I'd made some commits to it, but it wasn't really a business yet. And it was, you know, as I told you a bit more of my story, it was kind of hard to convince my wife that the, the way this should work is I'm going to go with my roommate from college, and we're going to make software, and we're going to give away for free, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to work out. <laughs> well, while she's doing her 80-hour-a-week um, medical school stuff. But the thing that, that really happened uh, you know, mentally for me is... And, and a lot of this, I'll, I'll give uh, you know, credit to Luke's perspective. And there's a ton of people influence how I think about this stuff. Um, some of them are here. Um, and I'll get to velocity in a minute. But uh, we really wanted to change the relationship between people and computers. We wanted to change the way that people thought about their computers. We didn't want to have the do it five as the way that people thought about it. Like We wanted to get it so you could consistently manage these complex systems at scale in a way that you know, basically very few people outside of, of some of these other uh, organizations I'm going to talk about in a second were able to do. But what turns out, and this is part of the Cloud Foundry story, is you actually need to change the relationship between people and other people. As much or more than you need to change the relationship between people and the computers. Because going back to Conway's law, if you have a bunch of different ideas about how the world works, then you're probably, or, or God forbid, different incentives then you're probably not going to do the greatest job with your computers. And so this is the, this DevOps story. Er, everyone's read the Gartner report on DevOps and how you need to uh, change your culture. But I don't think you can really talk about DevOps if you don't talk about velocity. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to bring up some ideas that people haven't thought of before, or at least not um, articulated. And this is a, a conference that I consider the first DevOps conference. This is certainly... Uh, a slide that was, was th this is from uh, Velocity 2009, John Allspaugh and Paul Hammond giving the talk about 10 deploys, to, 10 deploys per day at Flickr. And they had, they had these slides. And for some of us who'd kind of been around them and been around this conversation, it was just like, oh yeah, you know, Paul and John, they like do this thing. And there'd been a bunch of these threads. But for people who'd not been in that world, who hadn't thought this way, hadn't seen this stuff, it was like, and we'll, we'll come to more of that. Uh, this is actually the first recorded use of the word DevOps. And these are from that session at Velocity. And this is my Twitter. So this is uh, July 3rd, 2009. I just cut and pasted that image from Twitter this morning. And the, you know, we're, we're, we're having the same conversation, but this basically hasn't really changed since then. It's just it's propagating through the rest of the, the industry. But the thing I want to draw attention to with respect to M or, uh, Velocity is Velocity was started as a guy from Amazon and a guy from Google as the chairs putting together this program around web operations and performance. And what, what that represented was, as I mentioned earlier, these communities of practice coming together and sharing their ideas, sharing their successes, sharing their failures. You know, the, some of the most interesting things, and this is interesting, especially in a culture where it's very uh, blameful, that, that you, you share your, your failures, right? You let people understand how you failed so they don't fail again, so they don't feel like you. But everyone, everyone hears about Amazon, and this this bookstore. You guys, has anyone ever ordered anything from this bookstore? <laughs> My wife gets like three boxes a day from Amazon. But... This is, this is the last public thing I heard them say, and this is a couple of years old now. But according to my sources, this is actually an order of magnitude off now. So they're, they're closer to a deployment every second. I mean, they, 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 they might not say that out loud, but I, that's, that's roughly what I would imagine. But then you have to understand, and we'll get to this in a minute, is that's not like monolithic deployment, right? That's like thousands and thousands of services, each being updated independently. This is, this is a quote from Werner Vogel. Who knows who Werner is? It tells you on the slide, so hopefully you can figure it out. <laughs> um, and I won't, read, I won't read all of it, but if, if you haven't, um, this is from 2006. So this is three years before anyone said the word DevOps. 
He said, at Amazon, if you build it, you run it. Right? If you, this brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software. It also brings them into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. And it will change the dynamic of your organization very, very quickly if the person who is going to feel the pain for a bad decision on their code actually gets paged for that bad decision. Like, changes thing, I don't think anything changes things faster. Right? And it's one thing to connect incentives and a bunch of stuff, but if you, if you move pain to the right places, like, it goes away. Right? Just a quick aside, does anyone know the experiment where they like, give the guys the shocker? This like a classic California experiment? Humans are weird, man. What are we doing? It's like, you're just going to shock the guy? All right. So everyone looks at Amazon, and they rush to copy this. There's like, oh, there's the cloud. Amazon's advantage is not the fact that they put an API in front of hypervisors. Right? Like, I think that if you look at some of the stuff that's happened with other attempts to make open source solutions to that problem, you realize it's not, that's not the hard part. These are superficial features, and really the big advantage Amazon has is the, is the process and the culture that produced that. The artif the, those are artifacts of this other thing, and they, are, they have a huge advantage against most other people in this space, although uh, you know, there's a short list of people that, that could compete with them with respect to operating a massive web infrastructure at scale, I don't know what just happened, uh, with the, the cost of operating that is something that they are able to press down and down and down, which is why they can provide the level of service they can at the prices that they can. And that's why you're seeing you know, roughly 30% decrease in the cost of their, of their services year to year over the last four or five years. This is from uh, O'Reilly Radar, which is also kind of related to, to Velocity. And they're arguing here that operations is the secret sauce. And they're talking about startups. So what you're seeing on the left is what we'll call you know, the doit5.sh solution to operations. And on the right, it's more of you know, the configuration management style, like very policy-driven, collapsing the complexity with uh, systems that can enforce across your, your full infrastructure. So in the bottom, what they're trying to show is the servers. So you, have, you, you did a bunch of work. You start your deployment. That, that, that peak there is the first deployment to, to production. And then as you grow servers, if you're using kind of traditional IT, then the cost of doing that is going to continue to go up linearly. Where if you've, if you've done this work to, to make the uh, kind of the configuration a non-issue, then it's still going to go up, but your, your, your linear factor is much, much lower. And so your, your overall total cost of ownership is much lower. And the thing that you have to understand if you're building services, which it seems like it takes a lot of people a while to get, is that day two matters, right? Like deployment is the price you pay to get to your real problems. And if you think about, you know, everyone kind of over-rotates on developers, developers, developers. If you are going to do the math about what it costs to own something, then the, on some timeline, the cost of ownership, if it's high to operate it, then that will dwarf, dwarf the, the development costs. Right? And if it's high, that, the time that it takes to equal that is, is very, very short. But, but many, whatever, for whatever reason, many uh, organizations don't internalize that. So what I want people to understand here is that these are really things that emerge from, from principles. Right? When you see someone using Puppet, that's not DevOps. Right? If you see someone using any tool, Cloud Foundry, it doesn't matter. That's not, that's not DevOps. So the principles are the greatest thing. If you understand that, then you can flexibly change to whatever you have to deal with. The practices that will naturally emerge as you understand these things are one thing. And then the tools are the last artifact. Like that's the lowest level thing about what we're talking about. So let's rewind. I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to go really fast. So let's rewind that. So software in the beginning, we had a bunch of stuff. We shipped it on CDs. It was hard to change after release. It runs on other people's computers. You don't have to really worry about bugs because it's out there on someone else's computer. But processes don't run really long. right? Like you, you turn off your computer, and you come back. So it doesn't matter if it has memory leaks so much. And there's no real uptime. I mean, memory leaks, who, who made some memory leaks before? That's right. So you don't, and this is all really, to me, like there's this story about, and this is what's powerful about software development, is you can take ideas and you can just make stuff, right? Like you manifest ideas as code. That's powerful. 
So this is the process in traditional thing. You have a good idea, you request a server, you get a purchase order, you wait, you wait, the server arrives, the server gets power network, server gets operating system, start to configure for the de deployment. And you have the sysadmin, and he keeps all this stuff running. He doesn't care about your application. He's not paid to care. He's waiting. Uh, other people need their service, too. And he's a cost center anyway, so he doesn't carry. And he has to worry about not just all these servers, but also probably email and maybe, God forbid, printers. <laughs> so then you shift to servers, your services, right? So like now we're not going to ship CDs. We're going to have services. So the Internet changes all this. We run things on other computers. There are computers. We can change those computers any time we want. You still have to worry about bugs, and processes now run a really long time, and uptime becomes everything. Right? Like that's this transition that not everyone in the industry has made, but that the, the big web lives and dies by. And, and we'll get to this platform story in a minute. So then, this is bigger, faster. This is a Google data center. And you always hear people say, we're, we're, we can't do this. We, we're the enterprise. Our ways are different. We have this thing. <laughs> right? And, and it's like, what our strategy is, is we're going to just slow everything down. <laughs> and and this, is, this moving slow is an advantage. How? I don't know. So this is a, this is a classic slide from uh, Velocity Conference talks I gave and use all over. So you have developers and operations. What you're going to do is you're going to put a wall between them, probably a ticket system. And then everyone's unhappy. And then this is pretty much what happens. <laughs> So our, our, misaligned, our misaligned incentives an advantage. That's really not how the web was built. Right? Like, no one at Google or Amazon, I mean, there's InfoSec and there's a bunch of other stuff, and so there's definitely still gating, and it's not a free-for-all, and we'll get to that in a minute. But it's not a competitive advantage if you have to go through this, this kind of process. And what's, what's evolved, or what we're talking about now, is these narratives around uh, platform uh, DevOps, continuous delivery, microservices. Who's read any of these books? So continuous delivery is a great book. Jez Humble is a great writer. Um, the Phoenix Project is really a rewrite of the goal, uh, which is the theory of constraints framed with IT. And release it is a bunch of patterns for it's kind of the stuff you see in, in the Google or uh, Netflix open source with respect to uh, some of these patterns. So then. We, we have this new narrative that's emerging, and we have a bunch of new tools. And, and this is definitely part of my story. So now we have a new process. And the process is I have a good idea, and I get a server, and, and, I, and I can make cloud API calls, right? And so I get a server in minutes now. And I run my configuration tools, and then in minutes, everything's up. And that's pretty cool. Principles, practice, tools. But then there's this guy. Who, who knows who this is? Now he's a venture capitalist, so he turned to the dark side. but. Uh, he, used to, he used to lead a lot of the cloud stuff at Netflix. And he, these, are, these are like straight stolen from some of his presentations. So he's like, this is what I learned. Speed wins. Remove friction from the product. High, high trust, low process. No handoff between teams. I think this is the hardest thing for a lot of the, the, the people who have really ingrained you know, their identity in these processes to overcome. Freedom and responsibility culture. We're not going to cover everything with all these rules, what we're going to create is a bunch of highly empowered people that can take responsibility for our success or failure. And then don't redo things that you don't have to do. right? And use simple patterns automated by tooling. This is like word for word off of his presentation. Self-service cloud, this is the key. Self-service cloud makes impossible things instant. And this is something that every kind of DevOps project always aspired to do, is like be able to give you self-service. Right? But rarely you get to there. Because there's all these other things you have to solve. It's one thing to configure servers. How are you going to solve the role-based access? How are you going to do the API to do the orchestration to then get the server and then you run your puppet? Right? Like there's a bunch of other stuff. And everyone aspires to do that, but very few people actually get there. I've got there before with those tools. I think an integrated solution is a better way to go. So here's another thing. I want everyone in this room to internalize, especially if you work for enterprise. But we're an enterprise. We do not have the talent to do this. This is a quote from, from Adrian as well. But Netflix has a superstar development team, and we don't. This is what he told them. We hired them from you. We hired all those people from you. And we got out of their way. So this is, this is this impact of batch size. So I want people to understand when we start talking about rapid changes to these infrastructures, it's actually safer. 
So if you imagine risk accumulating as you write code, and then every time you do a deployment, it comes back down, then if you do big batches, the amount of risk you're exposing yourself to is higher. Your exposure to the risk is less frequent, but the actual total risk is higher. And just think about it mentally. If I do a deployment of something I wrote an hour ago, and there's an actual problem, then it's not a big mystery where that code is. I can go fix it immediately. And so you're minimizing your time to recover, and you're not that worried about, about the impact because you know you can minimize it very fast. And so what, what's happening in these web companies is their time to recover goes to almost zero. And so they're, they're very, plus they have, continuous delivery is predicated on continuous integration. If you don't have culture of testing, if you don't have a culture of monitoring, then don't do this stuff. But as you get those capabilities, uh, then, you, then you should aspire to do this because it's both faster and safer. And you want to go faster because John Boyd. Well, I, I don't have time to get too OODA loop. And I'm way over time, and I still have more slides. So it is not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. Edward Deming. So Netflix built a platform to enable self-service deployment. They build a platform to deploy and operate microservices. They build a platform to continuously deliver software. They build a platform that could protect itself from failure. What Netflix did not do is build a platform for general ad hoc automation. That's another thing people need to understand. Because the platform makes promises, and the constraints are the contract that allows the platform to keep those promises. So when you start thinking about 12-factor apps, and that's, that's the contract that Heroku uh, decided to make with their platform. Uh, and there's a bunch of other platform contracts you could imagine. But if you, if you just allow anything, then you didn't really solve anything either. Right? And then you're right back to trying to figure out what's wrong when you have a problem. If you collapse what you're, what you're able to do, those constraints are actually enabling. Because 80-20 rule that you can get 80% of the benefit from 20% of the features most of the time. So DevOps refers to the practices and tools that emerge from high-performing organizations. And continuous delivery is a result as a consequence of that practice. And this is not possible with gating and handoffs. Now, we could debate continuous because there's like a quantum of delivery, but in reality, like you want to shrink your batch size and you want to shrink the cost of delivery. Because it's not possible, it's untenable if the fixed cost of deployment is high. If you have a high fixed cost of deployment, then you do it all the time, that's expensive, right? And microservices is just a description of the post-cloud, post-DevOps, post-continuously deliver, post-continuous delivery architecture. It's not, it's a natural evolution. So this baseline operational capability that you get when you can do a deployment on demand, and then the other thing that this is giving you is the team dynamics to, to leverage Conway's law, because you're decoupling the amount of people that need to be involved by, by enforcing the contract and the API as your, as your communication, then you can decouple. So each of those can be deployed them, uh, independently. Like, that's the whole point of microservices, is that you have uh, loose coupling. Right? If, there, if you have to deploy them all together, then you don't really have microservices. What you have is a monolith that you broke apart. Right? You, you, didn't, you didn't actually get to a microservice because you're not decoupled. And I'm going to argue that continuously delivered microservices are the natural evolution for services that need to run at scale and be changed frequently. And that a bunch of people uh, built platforms to do this, but those were one-off platforms. <laughs> and that continuous delivery is a why, DevOps is a how, and microservices is a what. But all of them, you basically need a platform. You can't, until you can take arbitrary code and put it on a server and have it run, you can't do continuous delivery, right? Until you can have something that is relatively monitored and, and safe and maybe even self-healing, you can't really do microservices. And, and to be able to do that, to build all the scaffolding around doing that, that looks suspiciously like a platform. Do you want to build one by yourself? There's this thing. Maybe you've heard of it. And maybe, maybe you don't want to build one by yourself, but maybe we can build one together. 
And this is the new process. You have a good idea, push code to the platform, it's running in seconds, self-service, self-healing, and we all live happily ever after. <laughs> but here's what I want you to, this is like the takeaway. No one set out to do microservices, continuous delivery, any of this stuff. These were natural consequences. So don't fixate on the words. Like, I, uh, it's annoying to me when people are like, you know, we're so agile. It's like, well, you guys suck at software. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, don't tell me how DevOps you are. Tell me, like, how much you're, like, kicking ass for your company. And this is actually not the end, because what's happening now with the Internet of Things and big data and everything getting bigger and faster, that means that in the next five years, the, I say the average, if you just start to do math on time series and sensors and all this stuff, the average Internet of Things deployment is going to put enterprises on the scale that Google had to be at maybe five, ten years ago. It's just, it's just math, right? And, and if you are still stuck in the past with your processes and your thoughts about how to do this stuff, you're going to be at a, at a huge disadvantage. And someone else is going to build that future for you. So I work for Pivotal. I work on Cloud Foundry. Uh, I get a little excited about stuff, and I'm way over time. But thanks for sharing this time with me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, thank you.